beginning of an experience, when the paralysis is happening, imagine electrical current. There's a lot I don't know, but I do know that they're here. What we're experiencing is contact with actual intelligent beings. So that's when I knew for certain that the kids were being abducted as well. I thought the aliens would attack me. Would attack you and do what? Hurt you? Yes. How would they do that? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you all for coming. I speak for all of my family in appreciating the, the effort you've made to come and touch us, to be with us, to, uh, to share with us in appreciation of my dad, my father, John Mack. You're his friends. His John Mack was a distinguished psychiatric doctor and one of the most respected professors at Harvard University. John Mack died in a car accident in September 2004. Today, the scientific community at Harvard, and also his colleagues, family, and friends, are bidding him a last farewell and a solemn tribute. John Mack treated some of the many people around the world who claim to have been abducted by extraterrestrials. After working for years with several hundred of them, he caused an uproar when he revealed that these people were not crazy but were telling the truth. Today I'm in Boston. I met John the year before he died. It was then that we started working on this film. Several people here, like Randy, have become friends over the last year. Randy is an abductee, one of the people who have experienced encounters with other beings, experiencer, as John used to call them. Rudy Shield is also here. Rudy's a renowned scientist in the U.S. and an astrophysicist at the Harvard Center for Astrophysics. He and John were close friends. The person is uh, in the car or sleeping and then it's entered, there's a light, these entities come into the room, they feel themselves paralyzed, they're moved, they're taken, they go into a ship, something happens there, there may be other people there, they have uh, telepathic communication with the aliens, there's some probing, there's a whole complicated set of events that takes place which is consistent from one person to another. But there's a basic story here that after several hundred cases in this country and in many other countries, it all begins to hold together as, as something that has a, a very a robust kind of um, truth uh, to it. And, and uh, if this is real, then what does that mean? I'm Stefan Alex, an investigative journalist, formerly a war correspondent. With this professional background, I began this investigation two years ago into the manifestation of life in the universe. While I didn't have any preconceived ideas on the subject, tales of UFOs seemed somewhat far-fetched to me. I was intrigued, however, on discovering that serious scientists were devoting a great deal of time to conducting research on the subject. After several months, I was compelled to face the facts. No, we can't explain it all. Far from it, even. And Rudy Shield wouldn't be one to disagree. He's just published the fruits of his years of astrophysics research, which should earn him international renown. According to this tireless research, a current scientific certainties are proving to be increasingly fragile. The astronomical view today is that probably any star in the sky that you would look at probably has one habitable planet. And so it almost takes a great act of religious fervor to believe that life did not start somewhere else in the universe. I would say that when I listen 
to these experiencers and their stories, I find that in them an incredible coherence. In other words, if they were trying to just make up some story, I don't think that they could make up 15 or 20 facts that all are compatible and self-consistent in a picture of a distant civilization. In this way, I could persuade myself the way John Mack has persuaded himself that these people are not making these stories up. The alien abduction phenomena has been subject of research in America for over 30 years. I went down to New York to find the first man to spur interest in this field. John introduced me to him last year. This woman, Blanche, was a psychologist, and she asked me, did I want to meet uh, Bud Hopkins? And I said, who's he? She said, well, he's a, an artist in New York who uh, works with people who uh, have had the experience of being uh, taken by aliens into spaceships. And I thought this was absolutely crazy. This was too far out for me. She said, no, it's very real. You should go meet him. So I went to see him. There were several of the people were there. Uh, and I, uh, I was struck by the fact that they were very um, regular people, ordinary people, except that they had had extraordinary experiences, you know. And um, that was mind-blowing for me. Bud Hopkins lives in downtown Manhattan. He first heard about the phenomenon of extraterrestrial abduction in 1975. He's the one who first published books on alien abduction. Since then, he's analyzed hundreds of new cases. I asked Randy if he wanted to meet us at Bud's house. He knew Bud well. Randy was one of John's patients. He claims to have had extraterrestrial encounters since childhood, encounters which have left him profoundly traumatized. It was this trauma, similar to that suffered by a number of war veterans, that convinced John that something very real was going on and that these abductions could not have been simply invented. A light totally filled the room, like everywhere. It seemed like it was coming from everywhere. I couldn't move. And uh, I saw these four beings, creatures, whatever you want to call them. Basically, I like there's something different, other species other than us. Um, came into the room. I don't know how they got in the house. I mean, it seemed like they came right through um, the wall, believe it or not. And um, I could see them all down the side of my bed. And there was four. One was right close to my face, probably a foot and a half away. And... Uh, I couldn't move, and then I was freaking out. I mean, so when I turned to f face them, I was going to fight, you know. I was going to defend myself. And I couldn't move until that point, you know. I was frozen with fear. And um, when I turned to face them, that's when... The one closest to me had this rod-like device started coming toward me as I was turning to face them toward this way. And his arm was coming toward my neck and as I could see it coming toward me and it was coming fast. And it's, oh, it was almost like time slowed down in that second to, because uh, my whole life just because I thought I was going to die. I thought that was whatever that was coming toward me was going to kill me. And um, my whole life flashed before my eyes. And then, uh, then it hit my neck, and then I just lost my, my, uh, my whole body froze, or just I couldn't feel it anymore. And I felt it made a sound. It was electrical, some kind of, some kind of electrical... Uh, um, you know, uh, I don't know how you, it's like an electrical um, buzzing sound. And, uh, and then it, it seemed like it shut my body down systematically, my physical body, and then my mind, and then my, like systems, system by system, 
felt like it shut my whole body down. Um, but every time I go to what ha remembering what happened, it's there. It's there. I mean, and I can't. I just know it right here in my gut that um, what happened was real and very disturbing to me. The abduction phenomenon uh, came to public attention in 1966 uh, with the Betty and Barney Hill case. But I have cases that date back to the 1920s, so we have no idea how long it's been going on. But essentially this is what happens. The UFO craft uh, have occupants, beings, who seem to be essentially interested in human beings as objects of study. What generally happens during an abduction is that the person is paralyzed, generally then sees the approach of small figures with large heads. Uh, it's extremely terrifying at that point for virtually everybody, naturally. Uh, that person or persons are then lifted up a beam of light, we have no idea how this works, into a craft, taken inside, they are still paralyzed, unable to do anything, and then a series of physical examinations take place which concentrate attention on the, the brain, the reproductive system, and the central nervous system. The conscious memory is pretty much suppressed, not totally, but pretty much suppressed so the person has sections of the memory but not the whole story, and is totally confused. Did this really happen? Am I going crazy, etc.? But one of the uh, most important things to realize is that the person is taken again and again through his or her lifetime. In other words, this isn't just a one-time thing. It's as if that person has become an object of very systematic study by the UFO occupants. It's interesting to see how similar they are. They were totally separately drawn, different places, different times. It's true that now we are very used now to this we're, kind of figure. Now we're familiar. That's the thing. But not at the time these things were, uh, were done. Th this is interesting. This is scary. <clears throat> because they don't, look, um, they don't look muscular and powerful and threatening. They look skinny and, uh, and weak. Uh, but <clears throat> the, the terror, I think, comes from the fact that when people look at them, they don't know what's going on in those minds. They don't understand what, that, what those figures are thinking. I want nothing more than, in the world than for uh, people with scientific credentials that are extensive, and, and especially mental health professionals, to get into this and take it very seriously. Uh, no matter what their opinion is, they can start off thinking there's nothing to it. I don't care. If you're interested enough just to look into it, that's all, I requ that's all I'm asking. So I was extremely pleased when John did it. It was very daring of him. It was a very daring thing. It was very helpful. John Edward Mack was born in New York on October 4th, 1929. In 1955, John graduated from Harvard Medical School. He married Sally Stahl in 1959. In the late 60s, he founded the Cambridge Psychiatric Hospital and would rapidly secure it a worldwide reputation. In 1972, he became a full professor of psychiatry at Harvard University. 1977 was a turning point in John's career. He was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for his biography of Lawrence of Arabia. When he treated his first experiences, John had had almost 40 years of professional psychiatric practice. In 1994, his conclusions about alien abduction phenomena caused a scandal. 
yet they would be supported by many other medical teams. He wrote that the reported abductions were not hallucinations, nor were they schizophrenia, psychosis, or any other mental condition. He stated these abductions were not dreams. The abductees were sincere, they had nothing to gain, and were aware of the absurd nature of their experiences. Amazingly, they had all told the same story, down to the slightest detail. Just south of Boston, in Martha's Vineyard, I met up with Dominic Kalimanopoulos. Dominique was John's research associate, research which took them all over the world. After John's first book was published, the question arose as to whether this phenomenon of extraterrestrial abduction was occurring outside of the U.S. as well. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Without exception, everywhere we went, people had experienced some of the classic abduction. Um, with the gray beings that is, has been so commonly reported in the States. We talked with a lot of individuals about their experiences, but there's something about talking with, you know, a group that has collectively experienced the same thing um, that is just more convincing and seen as more legitimate. In the case where we spoke with young children who had experienced a visitation from two UFOs and the two beings who had hovered over their playground during recess. This was at a small secondary school outside, Zimba, outside Harare in Zimbabwe. And 60 children at recess had seen these two UFOs hover, two alien beings come out. And I even remember how one little girl described it to me. She said, it was as if they were kind of floating above the grass towards us, or hopping across the grass towards us. And in this case, um, I remember John's voice very specifically as he asked one little girl. And these were very disciplined, sort of post-colonial, ch little children, um, different races with braids, very well spoken. And John said, well, what would you call these beings that you saw? And she'd say, I'd call them aliens. I'd call them alien beings. In September 1994, over 60 children from this school in the suburbs of Harare, Zimbabwe, witnessed several objects landing and two beings coming out. Just over two months later, John and Dominique came to the scene to work with the children, their parents, and the teachers still suffering from shock. John, who essentially specialized in child psychiatry, devoted a great deal of time to interviewing the children. Something scared you, is that right? Is yes. The, what, what scared you? The noise. What noise? The noise that we heard in the air. You heard a noise in the yes. air? What was it like? Like a roar or a buzz or a hum or what kind of a noise? It was like someone was playing a flute. It was scary myself. It was scary because you saw something yourself? Yes. Mm -hmm. I saw a little object hovering. It was quite big actually and then there was little ones all around it. We saw something silver and then we quickly ran to the loud to the logs and we saw a silver, silver thing and we saw a man standing next to it. Uh, what was it, what did it feel like when he was looking at you? I felt scared. It, it felt scared? What was scary about it? Well, I felt scared because I've never seen such a person like that before. Did you see the eyes? What did they look like? They were um, going like that. Where was the pointy part? It was the pointy part in here, or was the pointy part out there? Yeah. Up there. And what was the feeling when you looked at the eyes? Um, it was scary. Mm -hmm. And what? Scary? Why? What made it scary? The eyes looked evil. Evil. Mm -hmm. And what was evil about them? Mm -hmm. Say what you mean by evil. <laughs> It looked evil because it was just staring at me. With what? Staring at you as if what? As if to do what? As if it wanted to come and take us. As if it wanted to come and take you. That was the feeling you got? That it wanted you to go with it? Did you feel like you wanted to go with it? No. Did you feel... What was the effect on you when, when you felt it wanted to have you go with it? Well, I just um, walked away and I started crying. 
they came running up here in such a panic. And, I mean, even if we had staged it, they could not have run all together like that. Even if we practiced it, I don't know how many times. But they came up here like a living snake. And they just came, we were in a staff meeting, and we just heard them screaming, screaming, ah, and then they were here, you know, and the child can't make that up. I was very skeptical in the beginning as well. Um, I believed that they'd seen something, but I wasn't prepared to accept that it was anything supernatural or anything like that. But I think the consistency of, of what's been going on indicates that it was more than I was prepared to admit in the beginning. So both of them were running. One was running um, in the trees, and the other one was run, running across the ship, because mm -hmm. there were also trees here. Mm -hmm. The eyes were, were like more pointed as they came in toward the center of the yes. head, is that? Yeah. No, more circular. And this was all black. Now. All black. Now you so made pupils. Did they actually have pupils? Or yes, was the it pupils were white. What? The pupils were white like that. And you saw white in the center? Yes, like that. Mm -hmm. Was he near the, uh, the silver object or was he far from? No, on top. On top of the silver yes. object. Okay. And um, did you look at him? Yes. Did he look at you? He didn't give me the creeps, then I stopped Gave you the creeps. Actually, in your drawing, you showed him standing up, didn't you? Yes, I had to draw him standing up, because I couldn't draw him sitting. <laughs> <laughs> what I thought was maybe the, the world's going to end. Maybe they're telling us the world's going to end. Um, well, why do you think they might want us to be scared? Mm. Because um, we, maybe because we never we don't look after the planet and um, the area properly. Mm -hmm. And Lily, really this is is this an idea that uh, you have had before that we don't look after the planet properly in the air, or did this idea come to you when you had this experience? When I had this experience. Mm -hmm. And how did that idea come to you from this experience? This is a little hard, but try, try to be with me here, okay? When you, how did this idea come to you when you had this experience? I just felt all horrible inside. You felt horrible. At what point did you feel that? When you saw the craft or at, when you got home at night? Or when I got home. You had that horrible feeling when you got home? Yes. And say more about that horrible feeling, Lisa. What was it like? It was like in the world, all the trees will just go down and, and there will be no air and people will be dying. Mm -hmm. And those thoughts came to you, had you had those thoughts before this experience? No. No. And did, how did those thoughts come to you? Did they come to you from the craft or from... From the man. The man. And the man, did the man say those things to you? Uh, how did he get that across to you? Well, he never said anything. It's just that the face is the eyes. What, what was the sense you got from those eyes? He was interested. They uh, described these experiences or these events like a person talks about something that has happened to them. Uh, and. When you're talking with a, a psychotic who's telling you something and it's a delusion and you feel that it really didn't happen, I can tell. I mean, I know this is something that a person wants me to believe or they're frightened or they're distorting reality in some way. There's nothing like that here. These are people of sound mind, by and large, uh, telling me something that's very... They know that I might think they're crazy and so they're a little concerned about telling me and and they, they're very full of questioning themselves and doubt and I mean the way and then they describe something very real and intense a light or something happened to their body or they, they, it, it's the whole quality of the way they talk about it is the way a person talks about experience that, that happened to them 
John discovered that from Africa to Brazil, Australia to Turkey, all of the abductees described exactly the same beings. They were first depicted in 1977 in the film Close Encounters of the Third Kind. For the script, Spielberg took his inspiration from accounts by UFO experts and descriptions provided by abductees. Now these beings appeared on the big screen as a result of people claiming to have witnessed them and not the other way around. Certain traditional cultures have reported their existence for centuries. For example, Indians of the Amazonian rainforest dubbed these beings Ikuya, while they were referred to as the Mantidani by the South African Zulus. I discovered this aspect of John's work while I was staying with him. And it was here that I met Karen, one of his former patients. When I met John, Karen had just moved into the top floor of this beautiful house. Karen spoke of abductions that had been reoccurring since she was a little girl. Another experiencer, Will, had been working for the last five years at John's Research Institute. Will and Karen both have vivid and conscious memories of their experiences. They both managed to overcome the initial trauma of these encounters better than most and live normally while trying to come to terms with what really happened to them. It involves dealing with events which are not experienced in everyday life, missing time, intense physical sensations, etc. Uh, some of these experiences, um, you know, I hate discussing memory because it's, it, when you're having an experience, it doesn't feel like, like you've lost a part of your memory. It's more like time has been distorted. Right. You know, you walk into a hallway, something happens, and then it's five hours later. Right. It doesn't feel like you've lost a part of your memory. You were conscious and aware the entire time, right. but it seems like a section of your life got skipped. Yeah. Like edited out. Or yeah, something. I got edited out of the film. Yeah, like it's just like the film was just spliced together. So you're completely conscious and completely conscious, but the, the two frames don't make sense next to each other yeah. because there's this whole piece in the middle that's missing. So to give you a sense of what it would feel like, right now you, we're, we're having tea together, yeah? So you have a sense of what this feels like to you, yes? Now imagine the very next second from when I stopped speaking, all of a sudden you find yourself out in the street by the car. In the very next second, no skipping of, of, of time. Do you understand what I mean? Yes. So, T now, next second, outside car. And you're conscious here, and you're conscious at the car. Wouldn't you wonder what happened? Like, how you would be at the car, and you would think, how the hell did I just get out here? I was just in that second before drinking tea. You don't remember walking away from the teacup. You don't remember walking to the door, saying goodbye to us. You have no idea what happened between the teacup and the car. But you were conscious at both places. You say what? I think it's uh, peas and carrots. I took a couple of years. When I woke up school, as an okay. adult in the room filled with the blue light, for a moment I thought to myself, is this a gas leak? Is this a gas explosion? Is there a fire? Followed immediately by the fear of they're coming. And I tried to shove myself underneath the bed, tried to hide, tried to squirrel myself away because there was nowhere in this small room to hide. And then sure enough, door opens up, and these two beings scurry in, and one touches my leg, you know, very physical, touches my leg. And I knew that that light meant that those things were about to show up. So the first part of it starts out as they meet us, as they meet the experiencer in this density, and it's that dense. But then there is the experience of being taken or leaving this dimension. And in the leaving of this dimension, Things don't feel so dense, and they don't feel so dense. It feels like the vibration shifts, that everything speeds up. It feels like the body um, becomes light. And for me specifically, it, it felt like my cells were being pulled apart, and um, that the speed of everything moved up, like you know, things were moving much quicker. If this was just something that was just happening, like it felt like in my mind, that just felt like dreams, I would have never told anybody about it. I would have kept that to myself. I'm aware that these stories are insane to the listener. I'm aware that they sound crazy to everybody else. Why would I want to go put myself out there and say, I have all these dreams that I think are real. That's, re that's retarded. That's stupid. I wouldn't do that. The only reason that I believe them, that they are what they are, is because my body was very physically involved in all of them and because these experiences, these beings, physically interrupted my world. What we've learned from many experiencers, including myself, who have described this experience in detail, I believe that what we're describing is two different realities meeting, mixing temporarily, and then separating 
leaving very little evidence. So I believe that these meetings of two worlds it seems to only be for a few minutes at a time. I don't know that an alien could appear in our world and stay here. What we've seen, or what I've seen, is them in our environment only briefly. 10 minutes, 5 minutes, 20 minutes. Uh, then they remove us, me, anyone, from their environment, take them into their alien environment for most of the time, and then bring them back. For centuries, people believed the Earth was flat. In the history of science, the most absolute certainties have been swept away by revolutionary discoveries. Could it be then that we're at the dawn of a new development? Boston, heading for the Canadian border, where I had arranged to meet two New Yorkers, Michael and Trish. Michael's a writer, Trish, a former company director. In September 1997, Michael and Trish, who had recently met, were preparing to spend their first weekend together. It was then that it happened, on this very spot. Hi, Stefan. Hi, Stefan. It's great to see you. <laughs> nice, nice to see you. Did you have a good trip? Yes, very good. Very good. So I'm glad you're here. Are you sure that everything happened? Yeah, it was uh, when we woke up in the middle of the night, the object was out over the lake between this tree and this tree. What kind of object was it? Well, I saw a large egg-shaped ellipse with a big light coming out of it. So and from my view from the house, I didn't see the ellipse, the elliptical shape so much, but I saw this huge beam of light coming out 20, 30 feet high. Yeah. Michael had known for many years that he was an experiencer, while Trish had never heard of this phenomenon. That night, Michael found himself sitting on the foot of the bed with his eyes wide open, watching an extremely bright object outside hovering over the lake. Shortly afterwards, Trish found herself at exactly the same place, while Michael had gone into the kitchen to observe the object. Neither of them have any recollection of what happened from the moment they went to bed to the moment they found themselves sitting on the foot of the bed. They both wanted to explore this mental blank individually through light hypnosis sessions with John Mack. These sessions would help them to remember the entire experience, and it turned out that their respective versions were virtually identical. Seeing the UFO was not the whole experience. It was only the end of a much longer experience. And so what we discovered was that between the time we went to sleep and the time we woke up, that, that we'd actually had an encounter. I recalled uh, suddenly being higher than the bed. I, I was lying on the bed on my back, and my feet were... Um, I could see my feet turning up a little like your feet would if you're lying down, the toes are up higher. And I could see them, and I, I was lying down, and I could feel that I was maybe a foot above the bed. And I was really interested in that. <laughs> I thought, wow. And But I could just feel it, and then my body started to move, um, and it turned slightly, and it, it went toward the wall, and I just kept moving, and soon I was moving through the wall and I would think that that would be basically crazy but that's what was happening and uh, somehow I was moved into this uh, light tunnel. I don't know because I, I can't see where I was or if anyone was with me but I was kind of like tilted back you know I don't really know how to explain it but if I'm up straight I was kind of like tilted back and then I thought I saw some beings, but I couldn't get a clear image. It was like if you had a, a camera and you kept turning the lens and putting the person in and out of focus. I couldn't really focus on them, so there'd be kind of a shape of like five shoulders and heads looking at me. And then I was moved to another place, and there was kind of like a big light shining on me with some sh silhouettes of people. 
or beings, and then I was brought to another place. I didn't have really a lot of clear images. And then suddenly, I was uh, going backwards through the tunnel that I had just gone forwards through, and I could recognize the sequence of the colors, and so I knew I was going back through the very same thing that I'd gone through, and then suddenly there was just blinding light, and I was uh, sitting on the edge of the bed. There was uh, a being with me, um, and, and I was seated in a chair, and I was just moving down the tunnel. Uh, something was drawing me down, and this being was with me, and I, I was completely feeling love. I felt very comfortable and very secure. I felt surrounded by love. It was amazing. I just couldn't, I can't even explain it too well right now. I just felt so uh, safe. And uh, then I was, uh, the next thing I knew, well, this being was made of light. <laughs> Which I had never seen a being of light before. But I could see the eyes were brighter and then the rest of the, there was not a definition of a body, it was just light. And, um, but it was very loving and friendly. And then the next thing I knew, I was sitting on the end of the bed, looking out the window at this uh, tunnel of light, which is across the lake. I couldn't tell if it was disappearing or if it was being retracted back into the big ellipse, but it was either it was being pulled in or it was disappearing. And then for one moment, there was no extension. There was just the big egg-shaped object. And then it was gone. And it vanished, it vanished right before my eyes. Even more surprising is that the night before their experience, Michael, a romantic at heart, captured their evening on film so that if he and Trish were still together the following year, they could watch the tape. For no particular reason, he went to film outside. As planned, they watched the tape one year later, only to find that an unexplained object had been recorded. This is the uh, cabin that we stayed in when we had the encounter. That's the bedroom, that's the living room. Now I'm outside the cabin looking back in. There's me in the camcorder. But look, here's a light and a light, and I'm zoomed right in on it. And yet, and there's another one down here, and I, I really wasn't aware of them. It wasn't what I wanted to do. And the silent. See, it's completely silent. But now some geese come in. So you see that the camcorder is working. So what were those silent lights? And how did they just vanish? And the most amazing thing is that you, you don't remember it. You filmed that. I don't remember I filmed it. And see, now I'm back just making the dinner as if it never happened. And I didn't see the pictures for a year because we were still dating a year later and I took the video out. And that's when I saw the lights. <laughs> what was on this videotape, an object? I certainly realized that the emotions experienced by the abductees I had talked to were what really impressed me the most. Michael, Trish, Randy, Will, and Karen are all mentally stable people. For John, too, the individual testimonies were the most convincing evidence. As a psychiatrist, an expert in the workings of the mind, John had become certain that, as well as being sane, the abductees were telling the truth. The way science works, you get a, a pattern emerges, you know, which has a certain robustness. Uh, not everyone's the same. Some are more traumatized, some are more spiritually open, some are more involved with ecology, and some have more apocalyptic kind of images. And in this particular culture, this is not supposed to happen. So what? What's possible is a, is a matter of worldview. Uh, you, you, it's arbitrary. Uh, a culture decides what's real. What's real in this culture is completely different what's, than what's true in American Indian reality or uh, Tibetan Buddhist reality or uh, 
uh, Hawaiian kahuna reality or whatever. You know, we have one set of ideas of what's real, which is a very limited one. It's become more and more limited as the centuries have gone on. So that, as uh, poet Rilke said, the, when he, in talking about the spirit world, the senses by the senses by which we can know the spirit world have atrophied. As we don't even have the uh, the apparatus in our perceptual capability of knowing much more of reality. We've it's like we, we we've lost the the very senses to, to know beyond this limited physical horizon. Why do we so desperately want to believe that all this is impossible? This, however, is not the question that these abductees pose. They don't ask me to believe them, nor do they try to convince me. Is it what we call rationality that makes us reject what they have to say? Spending time with John made me realize that we don't have enough information to decide what is or is not possible, as too many things remain beyond our grasp. So I decided to listen, to continue my research, and to explore this new frontier. And this brought me to Sue and David's picturesque home in Vermont. Sue's 56. She's experienced abduction since childhood. They've been very traumatic experiences for her. In the course of time, she's managed to overcome her fear, among other things, by painting her visitors. It was so scary to me when I think about it, but then when I finally could, was able to paint it, then it didn't seem so scary to me. His face doesn't look that scary. He almost looks like he has a, a look of wonderment. But you remember precisely having seen this, yeah. this face? What, when was it? The first abduction Sue remembers clearly well, occurred when she was 19. A pulsating blue light woke her as it made its way across the bedroom. Sue was in bed, terrified and unable to look at it. They're here, she thought. But who are they? Her thoughts made no sense at all. She heard her mother get up, call her, and then go back to bed. Terrified, Sue found the courage to turn around. It was then she noticed two small gray beings. Then she passed out. The next day, her mother confirmed that she did get up after hearing a noise in her daughter's room, but that some sort of a force compelled her to go back to bed. Gradually, Sue would come to realize that she'd been abducted since childhood, but simply didn't understand what was happening. That was really when I was 19 was the first time that I remembered seeing these beings when I was a kid, coming into the room and then um, waking up and finding them standing next to your bed and being terrified and um, feeling that, I remember feeling that the world was just not a safe place, that there was nowhere that was safe that no matter where I went or what I did, um, that they could find me and that nobody could help me. Nobody could, nobody could stop it. It was really scary. <laughs> <laughs> scary way to grow up. And uh, so as I got older, that's what bothered me so much with my kids, was knowing that they were also being visited and there was nothing I could do about it. David, Sue's husband, manages a construction company. A nature lover, he's preparing for retirement by turning part of their land into a Christmas tree farm. David gets up at dawn every morning. He's never been abducted himself, and he lived with Sue for over 30 years. The trees on the sides of the field are all old, a lot of them, and uh, they're uh, starting to fall, you know, starting to fall on my Christmas trees and stuff, so, oh. so I take them down, use them for firewood rather than let them fall into the field. He's such a good boy. He's such a good boy. You have seen things yourself around here? Not so much seeing things, but being paralyzed. Oh, yeah. You know, held down, and uh, where I can't move. It was involved with things that were going on with Sue, as near as I can tell. And I tried to get up; I'd be paralyzed, and you know, I couldn't move. Do you remember what's happened then? Oh, I never can remember anything. Just before being paralyzed. 
um, just a noises or something, or she was stirring and I was trying to get up and, you know, to see what was going on. Might be obsessing, no? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, just, it just, uh, it even happened, that happens here to me, too. Seems like a heavy weight is holding me down. Yeah, just, you know, holding me in bed and, uh, uh, I, I can't explain it, except it, it's, I'm strong and I, I, can't, I can't hold it back and then I go to sleep or something and when I wake up it's okay. After lunch, David went outside to do some work on the farm, as he liked to call it, his Christmas tree farm. Winter was setting in. David and Sue have two children, Danny and Jake, who are both going on 30 and no longer lived with their parents. In 1990, Sue experienced an abduction in which her two children were also involved. Danny was 13 and Jake 11. Night had fallen. Sue and David were woken up by a blue light and their dog, Molly, whining. The dog was downstairs, petrified. Sue got up, but David couldn't get out of bed. Sue suddenly felt as if she was being pushed towards the stairs. As I walked down the stairs, I remember thinking, um, I'm going to make sure, I'm, I'm looking at, this is, this is my home, it's Sunday night, David's in bed, it's 11 o'clock, this is, you know, these are my pictures that are on the wall, this is the kind, this is the color of my rug, I know that I'm awake. And I stepped into the kitchen, and uh, Danny was standing there. He was 13. And he, uh, he was standing like a robot. I mean, his hands, his hands were really down like this against his side, and his eyes were really big, and he looked so scared. And I stepped toward him, and I remember thinking, my God, he's paralyzed with fear. That's the thought that went through my mind. And I stepped toward him, and I put my hands out to him, and I said, sweetie, they won't hurt you. They won't hurt you. You'll be okay. They won't hurt you. And it was like he couldn't even hear me. He didn't look at me. His eyes were just, like, straight ahead. And the light was all around us at that time. And I walked past him and pulled in behind him, stepped in behind him, and just as I stepped in behind him, I could see Jake coming in the other door into the kitchen. And I remember thinking I was so angry. Because I thought, they've been messing with me my whole life. Don't mess with my kids. But there was nothing I could do. And that's the last thing that I remember. Everything after that was like a dream. It we just got like really, you know, like in a dream where things, you know, out of sequence. And I knew I wasn't in my home. I didn't know where I was, but I could hear Danny screaming, and um, and, and I was just I, like trying to hit something. I remember it was just really crazy. And then uh, the next thing that I remember was waking up the next morning, waking up in bed, and. David was there, and uh, when I woke up, I, I laid awake for a few minutes, and I thought, it had to have been a dream. So he said, you did. You did get up. He said, um, and I did speak to you. You were walking around the end of the bed, and he said, you, I asked you where you were going, and you said that now he was crying, and that you were going downstairs. He said, I tried to get up, and I couldn't move, because I, it was like I was paralyzed and something was pushing down on me and everything went black and I couldn't remember anything after that and I remember feeling such total helpless fear You know, the birds are eating the bugs in the tree, so it's time to, you know, make it into wood. See the holes? Oh, yeah. Yeah, just why the limbs are breaking off, and it's just, uh, I'd rather burn it than just have it rot. 
What do you want to know, Captain? Just to know what you, what you're feeling about all this thing happening to, to Sue and your children. Oh! I don't know. I mean, I... it's something so, so weird. How did you react first when, when you, when was it the first time you, you noticed that something was going wrong? Uh, well, she started having, you know, these experiences she has since she was a child, and then, uh, you know, after the boys were born, there just more and more stuff happening to her. And uh, um, so we just, uh, you know, and I just learned more about it by listening to her, just like spirituality I've learned by listening and watching what happens. And, um, and you know, pretty much that's, <clears throat> you know, that's the way it is. It just, there's not much you can do about it. Um, there's just a lot of educated people that believe you know in the UFO phenomenon and I'm not putting myself as one of the educated but you have to keep your mind open for everything you know and uh, so that's what it is not a single person to date is able to provide a reasonable explanation for what happened to these experiencers they're honest people of sound mind and something external interfered in their lives it may be time to stop saying that anything that we fail to understand simply does not exist. I read this article, I, um, and I kept asking as I was reading it, because it was a kind of Jungian interpretation of the UFO phenomenon, and I kept asking, okay, but is this real? Now, what I meant was real probably was pretty literal at the time. I mean, are, we, are UFOs real? Are people really seeing aliens and you know this kind of thing and um, I guess if you ask a question strongly enough the universe cooperates and gives you information relevant to the question so where are you? 